in this exhibition, uh, I have gathered, as I said, a lot of evidentiary material. I have systematized it and analyzed it. Uh, one of the things that I've done is to look at the different phases of Nelly's artistic career from the 60s to the early 90s. And uh, while I was studying the different conceptual and stylistic strands in her work, I also realized that uh, I could, in a way, uh, propose that Nelly's work needs to be seen both in terms of her solo contributions, but also in terms of the collaborative relationships that she shared with her various associates. And that, and those, that collaborative relationship is what I would name as the Nelly Setna Studio. In the 60s, when she was uh, intensively experimenting, she had just come back from Cranbrook and she was making these six foot textile sculptures and mobiles. She was working with different kinds of yarns. Um, whether it's, it was jute or Cecil or cotton or wool, unpolished leather strips, unbleached cotton, uh, rayon, nylon, and so forth. So it was this incredible experimentation. But she was also working as the, uh, as the head of the textile design studio at Bombay Dyeing at that time. And she, uh, she, she started collaborating with her sister at that time, Rhoda Guster. So she would, there's, a, there's a photograph in this show where you have them working on a massive crochet piece. So, uh, so, so, the, so in a way, the rudiments of the Nelly Setna studio uh, were already put into place from the 60s onwards. As, as, she, as the disease ate away into her body, uh, she, uh, she was confined to a wheelchair by the mid-70s. And uh, she had started training from uh, uh, 1969 onwards, one of her associates, Roshan Mullah. And Roshan Mullah carried out the designs uh, and chromatic schemes of Nelly's. And even her role changes over the years. So um, she's called an associate, an assistant, but towards the last exhibition uh, at, uh, at the Jangirat Gallery, 1990, uh, which was in 1992, the same year that Nelly passed away, She's called the chief designer of the weaves. And uh, apart from that, in the 80s also, Nelly would, uh, you know, would, would, would print exhibition invites where she named all her associates, including uh, a, a, a cobbler, uh, Bhanu, who, who um, uh, made her leather hangings because he was very skilled at that particular craft. And, and, and also the domestic at home, the one who would help with threading the beads in the hangings. Um, so, so everybody was acknowledged. And this is quite unusual because you know, today when in, the, in the visual arts uh, in the world, when we talk, speak about collaboration, there are always these asymmetries where the craftspeople are not acknowledged by the Metropolitan Academy trained artists. But here was Nelly, whether it was in the 60s when she was working with her sister, her sister is acknowledged in the Illustrated Weekly article. You see a photograph of her with her sister. Uh, she was not interested in this modernist notion of the artist as genius. If anything, uh, perhaps she would, in the Kumar Swamian way, be, be more interested in the notion of a civilizational genius. And she always acknowledged the works of her associates. So therefore, one could speak both in terms of a solo practice in the 60s, but also from the 70s onwards, uh, one can speak in terms of the Nelly Setna studio with associates working in different phases of, of her career. But Roshan was her chief associate. Just as it was difficult to gather evidentiary material uh, on Nelly's life and art, it was also very difficult to meet and speak to Roshan Mullah. Uh, Roshan uh, is extremely reticent and uh, doesn't like to meet people much. Uh, she, stopped she stopped weaving in the early 2000s. The early 2000s was when she had her second solo at the Simrosa Art Gallery, and this was a tribute to Nelly Setna. After that, after a few years, she stopped weaving. So that chapter of her life was closed, and she didn't really want to speak about you know, what happened you know, all those decades ago. But the relationship that she shared with Nelly Setna is extremely special. 
And I would say that, say that they were like soul sisters, because not only was she Nelly Setna's chief associate, but as Nelly Setna, as, as Nelly Setna's um, you know, body slowly started giving away, she was also there as a family member, taking care of her uh, and, and, and helping her at, at all levels. So I, I, I'm also trying to find a way uh, to tell this story. And so this dense archival wall that I have in this exhibition has art historical annotations, but it also has uh, stories which don't belong to the frame of art history, but, they, but these stories are about human beings, the sense of interconnectedness, the sense of love and kindness and compassion. Roshan was technically very proficient and she could have struck out on her own at any time of her career, but she decided to stay with her mentor until she passed away. And uh, as, as women, for instance, you know, we, we would hate to use the word sacrifice because it reminds us of uh, grandmothers and mothers who lived unfulfilled lives. So uh, it's a term as feminists we, we would try to avoid. And therefore I was thinking, no, it wasn't sacrifice. It was perhaps it can be explained more through the Buddhist attitudes of Maitri and Karuna. You know? So, um, and, and, I, and I took a picture of Roshan, which is there in this show, where she's standing with her two dolls, which are handmade. She also uh, makes uh, soft toys. And in the corner of that, uh, of that photograph, um, I saw one of her figurines that she had made in her uh, days at JJ. And it's, it's of this uh, little girl who, who has a child on her back. And that made me uh, think about this, what collaboration really is about. It's, is it, it's about love, but it's also about uh, feeling a sense of burden. It's, it's about uh, nurturing and giving, but it's also about feeling spent. So all the vulnerabilities that go into uh, such intense relationships as the one that was lived between Nelly Setna and Roshan Mullah. 